Our next speaker is uh, Richard Budget. You already see uh, his slides on the screen, I hope. Um, there were some issues in the last speaker where people saw a black screen instead of the speaker's slide. The best way to solve that is to quickly log out and log back in, then the problem seems to be solved. I couldn't find anything quickly on the Zoom Q&As, so that's the only solution I have for anyone who, who experiences trouble right now. Um, so without further ado, the next speaker is Richard Budget. Um, little fact of all speakers, he's the only one with a Wikipedia page, so if you want to know more about him, <laughs> Google it. Um, but in short, he's a former Olympic rower, a gold and bronze medalist, and currently is the scientific director of uh, the medical and scientific director of the um, the IOC. So, Richard, if you just unmute your microphone, um, I will proceed to your next slide. Thank you very much, Everett. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes. Good. Thank you. Um, I think it's been fascinating listening to uh, our two previous speakers and. Um, now, from Martin, we understand about the clinical algorithms and uh, uh, how uh, to, to return athletes to sport. Uh, and then, Paul, thank you so much for the, the thoughts at the beginning of just how devastating this pandemic is and the um, uh, effect of fake news uh, and this infodemic. Um, so really, my first and last points are well covered. Um, and I'll just reflect on how fortunate we are to have the IOC research centers. We're very proud of them. Um, and also the um, uh, cooperation uh, with other institutes around the world and uh, Martin uh, chairing this respiratory consensus group, which was set up over a year ago and was supposed to meet um, this month in June. Um, but of course, events have overwhelmed us. That meeting is actually the late February. And Martin and his group have uh, turned all their energies to uh, um, doing everything they can to, to help with this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, working with people like Paul and Aspatar um, so that um, we can actually have good information available to all those who are caring for athletes. Because in the, in the end, the priority for the IOC is the health of athletes, but actually it's the health of everybody going to the game. So it's really important that we make the games uh, a safe uh, place uh, when they come around in 2021. Um, we have a, an Athlete 365 website which is specifically aimed at athletes um, and you hopefully have heard of the hashtag stay strong campaign that's uh, something that's supporting athletes there's a lot there on mental health as well which um, Martin and Paul have uh, emphasized is hugely important so um, the IOC are looking at this through an athlete prism but also through the, the prism of everyone who's involved. So I haven't got any slides, it's just the headlines. Um, I will focus on the five phases of the pandemic, uh, the role of vaccine and immunity, the, the mitigation and risk analysis we'll use and how the WHO put together the guidelines for that. And then also um, something about, and it's already been discussed, but what is the role of uh, PCR antigen testing, antibody IgG testing, and possibly apps. So, um, first of all, Tokyo 2020, now of course, Tokyo Olympic Games 2020 in 2021. Um, and, and I think one of the things about this uh, COVID-19 pandemic is the uncertainty for everyone. Um, we just don't know where it's going to go. It's been mentioned several times, the lack of evidence um, and the, uh, the desperate need to get more evidence to get the case series. Um, but one, uh, I suppose, helpful thing in the end was that we know when the games are going to be now. They're going to be next summer, almost exactly the same time they were going to be uh, in this July. Um, and an important group there as we prepare for Tokyo 20 is All Partner Task Force. I'm sorry about the, um, uh, the, the, the new terms, but the All Partner Task Force is a group um, put together by uh, the Japanese authorities and the IOC with the World Health Organization, and it has the public health experts from the mass gathering unit of the World Health Organization, led by Maurizio Barbeshi. Um, our own IOC public health experts, such as Brian McCluskey and Tina Hendricks, um, uh, ourselves in the IOC, uh, Tokyo 2020 Organizing Committee, and they are the public health expert, then the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, 
and uh, the, the Tokyo Health Authority, oh, sorry, the Japanese Health Authority. So we're all working together to make sure that we put in place the um, recommendations of the World Health Organization. We, uh, interestingly, just on the 16th of May, we uh, signed a new memorandum of understanding with the World Health Organization, which really cements the, the good relationship there is between um, the IFC and the WHO. But before we, we think about how we actually put in place the mitigation and the risk analysis, it's worth thinking about the five phases of a pandemic. Um, and it, it, it's a bit arbitrary, this, but you can uh, define the first phase as from the first case up to the point where the number of recoveries equals the number of new cases. Um, and that uh, can last a fair amount of time, maybe five to ten weeks, depending on the uh, measures that are put in place by a, a, a government or an organization. Then there's the control, from the control point, the second phase from the control point to the beginning of the relaxation of the measures that are being put in place and restrictions that are being put in place. And that could be a month or two. Um, and then the third phase is probably the most critical, which is where the measures start to be um, reduced, the restrictions are reduced, and over several months, um, uh, the, um, the the restrictions in a way and the sort of risk of the risk of the and many countries in uh, in Europe and around the world are in this third phase. And then there's the fourth phase, which some countries are already in, where actually the pandemic is under control and we're looking at just sporadic cases or clusters of cases which be, can be controlled um, using the uh, identification, uh, tracing, uh, testing, and isolation of the WHO are um, emphasizing. Um, and so as long as there are resources in place and the will in place by the authority, then in the fourth phase, where you've just got these clusters of individual cases, you can get this pandemic under control. And then lastly, there's a down to normal life with no restrictions. Now the question is, in these five phases, what is the role of any immunity or vaccine? Now when you uh, talk to uh, uh, infections around the world and they, they look back and again I have to say there's, there's such lack of information on COVID-19 but there's a lot of extrapolation expert opinion going on um, but there's a strong likelihood that this virus will mutate, will change and the uh, expectation is that the virulence, severity, infectivity should reduce. So um, over time as has happened with previous viruses even without a vaccine the um, uh, the, the, the problem would, would reduce the severity. Um, and allied to that is herd immunity. Now, the, there are a number of figures around uh, in, in Stockholm, they, they've estimated around 30% um, of the population have antibodies. In many countries, it's very low, around 6%. Um, but there may be more immunity in the population than, than that, um, thanks to the other uh, aspects of the immune response, or that uh, individuals have. Uh, uh, suffer from the virus but have a range antibody response so it's not picked up on the IgG tests. Um, and I think it's important to say that uh, the, the vaccine is part of the solution stage events. So it's already gearing up with the authorities to try and um, uh, uh, restart uh, all the uh, activities that would normally be going on with, without the vaccine in place. Um, and But I think whatever the situation is as we go forward over the coming months and then into next year, there will be uh, the hygiene measures maintained, there will be social distancing maintained, and the called three Cs, which I don't know if you've heard of the three Cs, which is um, the uh, closeness, the confinement, and conversation, uh, and even more than that, shouting and singing. Um, and those three, um, actually contribute significantly to transmission of any uh, any virus. Um, and uh, the, the next question I suppose is what is the, prog uh, the what is the progress on, on a vaccine? And it's been very interesting talking to uh, industry around the world, to uh, institutes, to um, uh, specialists, uh, that there is, as I'm sure you've seen, a very varied prognosis on the development of a vaccine. The um, uh, expectation is that sometime between eight and 18 months, there will be a vaccine that's available. But um, uh, 
many of the ones that are in advanced clinical trials are actually novel. They're nucleic acid, RNA, DNA coding for viral protein injected into the body. Um, they, they may be a viral vector, so um, the, the viral pathogen, this COVID-19, is expressed on a safe virus. Uh, and then there's the traditional attenuated pathogens, killed inactivated pathogens, etc. cetera. Um, so there's no guarantee that any of the viruses, that the, the, any of the vaccines that are in clinical trials will actually produce a um, uh, immunogenic vaccine that is safe and that can be uh, ramped up and produced in large quantities. But considering the enormous amount of work that's been done, the fact that nine vaccines already in phase one, phase two trials, that uh, the, um, uh, there are over 100 um, companies involved, that there are over 500 clinical trials of the nation. Um, I think the feeling is that there is a strong likelihood that there will be a vaccine uh, in due course, so we don't really exactly when it's going to be, and how effective it will be. Um, because if it's then 40, 50 percent, that's still hugely important. If you're a blind worker, um, uh, uh, um, perhaps 50 percent protection will be just fantastic. Um, but obviously, when we have to control the pandemic, that will be important, but not the whole answer. And we'll um, but it's also are very interested in this, then that will reduce the risk of holding a mass gathering. Remdesivir um, it is a possibility um, and is now used in severe cases. Uh, and we've heard about the story of some disappointments of, of other drugs. We might have to see how the trials uh, work out and the WHO is driving this. I want to come on to the mitigation and risk analysis for the Olympic Games. And this is really driven by our strong partnership with the World Health Organization. Many of you will be working with institutes or international federations or uh, national bodies that have used the guidelines of the World Health Organization, um, uh, the guidance they've issued in light of this pandemic, the risk assessment, the tool that will actually calculate uh, what is the uh, uh, likelihood um, of uh, whether the risk is very high, moderate, low, or very low. And uh, you can look this up very easily on uh, the WHO website, and on many of our uh, international federations and other websites where they've made it sport specific. Um, but the first thing to look at is, is the community spread? And obviously, it's very difficult to hold a mass gathering of this active community spread at the time. Not impossible, but it's difficult. Um, is the community spread in the, in the countries that are sending uh, individuals to the, to the event? Um, what groups, high risk groups are attending, the, the over 65, those who are ill, um, and how much you can, can you control those three Cs that we were talking about before? Um, and then uh, there's uh, the consideration of is it a high or a low risk sport? Um, there's a lot of discussion about uh, is uh, the, the you know, physical contact sports uh, and is that a higher risk, which it obviously is. Uh, the size of the event um, is it indoors or outdoors? Um, eh, what are the facilities at the venues, um, obviously hygiene facilities, enough space, um, what are the demographics of those who are going, and then very important, the communication of the risks, the education of everyone who's coming to the event, so that they um, actually uh, follow the guidelines and the, and the safety that's been put in place. And then you have the mitigation checklist that you can go through, and it all scores itself, um, the overview, Emergency, emergency preparedness and response uh, with uh, the coordination team, hygiene, PPE. The plan in place 
if people come become ill. And in the current environment, it's very likely as events start to be held that people will become ill during those events. Some of them will become ill with COVID-19, and then there needs to be a, a plan in place. Then screening. Um, do we use, and we've already talked about PCR tests, the, uh, uh, and do we uh, use screening the temperature? How effective is that? There's a lot of controversy about that, but certainly um, screening for symptoms is very important. Um, and any event needs to have the collaboration of the authorities, the command and control, um, public health awareness, and finally, uh, surge capacity in case there is a cluster of cases and make sure that can be dealt with. Now, I just want to end by actually talking about antibodies, antigens, and, and apps. Um, we talked quite a bit about this, but uh, uh, clearly the PCR tests uh, for antigen uh, are important, and it's good that the world generally is beginning to follow the World Health Organization uh, call for testing, 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 because that's the way we'll actually get the evidence about this virus, how it's transmitted, what its epidemiology is, who's infecting whom, and you know, should it be uh, one meter or more, as World Health Organization is saying, should it be two meters, should it be three meters, what about the different situations you're in, etc. Um, and then there's the, uh, the difficult role of antibodies. And obviously, <laughs> as individuals, I, I know so many people who are uh, dying to know whether they think they might have had the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, infection, but they're not sure. And they feel that they ha if they have an IgG test, that'll tell them and then they'll be immune and they'll be fine. Um, but as we've heard, uh, it's difficult to interpret. The immune system is so complex that you may have mounted an antibody response that's too low to actually register, so you're immune, but you don't know it. Or you may have antibodies and only just have been infected, so you're still infectious and actually about to develop symptoms, uh, and it may be a false positive. So uh, it, it has to be taken carefully. I think we've a little way to go. We need more evidence before we have this COVID-19 passport that people are talking about, so that you, you, you get something that says, yes, you're immune, and you can travel the world without any um, fears or, or um, liability to anyone else. And then there's the apps, and, and I think they do have an important role, and we in the sport community have a, an important role in um, uh, persuading people this is a community uh, responsibility to sign up to these apps. Um, and, the one, and, I, and I think it's good that people are overcoming all the concerns about uh, data protection. Uh, but we do have to take them in perspective because they're not the, uh, the single thing that's going to uh, um, uh, halt this pandemic. Uh, it really is situation dependent. The fact you're close to someone for, say, 15 minutes is not the be or It could be a few seconds. If they're talking animatedly, it could be less than 15 minutes. If they're just sitting there breathing, you might sit next to them for about 50 minutes and still not get an effective dose. So it depends on the situation you're in, uh, and in particular those three seats. Are you in an enclosed space? Are you in conversation? Are you very close? So I, I just want to end by saying for, thank you very much for the um, opportunity to talk, uh, to bring, for bringing us all together, Everett, um, and just to say that our priority in the IOC is obviously the health athletes, but it's also the health of everybody involved in the Games. And as has been said several times by, by our IOC president, we will only hold the Games where we are confident we can protect the health of everybody involved. And I'm glad to say that uh, with the partners, with the All Partner Task Force, with particularly the World Health Organization, with the help of people like you in our research centers and uh, uh, other institutes around the world, uh, we, we will be able to do that. So we're looking forward to uh, beating this pandemic together, uh, stopping mystery around the world, and getting back to normal and getting back to the, the thing that's central to so many of our lives, which